Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome you to this midweek Bible study as we continue our examination of 1 John. This letter written by the Apostle John to these believers in Ephesus, but it's also a, it's called a cyclical letter. It was written, it was read in churches on all of Asia Minor and down down through the ages. It's a letter that both shares truth about uh, our relationship with Christ, but also it's how to confront false teachings, what's not true. And so that's John's concern as he writes to these believers. He calls them little children, calls them that several times. And he wants them to continue in the faith. So that's that's what we're going to look at today. He's uh, last week we looked at these antichrist and that it was plural these are people that are opposed to the teachings of Jesus so the way you can know that a person is in Christ that is truly a believer a Christian has Christ living in them and is on the road to everlasting life, the way you can know that is they are in Christ. They're not opposed to Jesus. False teachers basically say it's Jesus plus something. And they give you some other, it's either, it's Jesus plus baptism. It's Jesus plus good works. It's Jesus plus speaking in tongues. It's Jesus plus whatever special uh, dispensation or, or concept or, or uh, experience that they uh, say is needed. But John and the other apostles uh, that were with Jesus and that wrote the New Testament, they they tell us it's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. In other words, you don't need anything else. It's Jesus only. Uh, Jesus is enough. And that's what John's getting at here in, as we end the, as he comes down to the end of chapter 2. Of course, the initial writings didn't have chapters and verses. Those were put in by people much later to help us in our study. And it was a letter that he wrote, probably over a period of time. But here he's in, in verses 24 through 27 of chapter 2 that I'm going to read uh, here in a moment. He gets to a core concept of John's theology that is a continuation of what he wrote in the Gospel of John. So we're going to today rely heavily on John's gospel that spills over then into the concept of abiding, of remaining. So I'm, I'm going to read verses 24 through 27 of chapter 2 of First John. What you have heard from the beginning, and this, this talks about not only the beginning of their faith, but at the beginning of the gospel, what, what you have heard must remain in you. In other words, he's encouraging these believers to continue in the faith. And what they believed at the beginning, what they heard from the beginning, what they received from the beginning, must remain in them to give evidence that they are truly followers of Jesus. It's one thing to believe something, uh, at least initially. But unless you continue in that, and that matures and and bears fruit, then it really has not become part of who you are. It's almost an outside concept. And so he's wanting them to internalize this. He said, what you have heard from the beginning must remain in you. If what you have heard from the beginning remains in you, then you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He Himself made to us, eternal life. I have written these things 
to you about those who are trying to deceive you. In other words, there were those who were or adding stuff to the gospel. They were adding their own spin, if you will, their own view of what it means to be saved or to be uh, righteous. And they're adding stuff that did not come from Jesus. And so the anointing you receive from Him remains in you. That anointing is the Holy Spirit. And the anointing then is the ability to understand truth. He says, and you don't need anyone to teach you. Instead, His anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. Just as it is as taught you, remain in Him. So he's, he's, he's concerned then about these people remaining true to the gospel. It's what he has shared in, in, in chapter 1. It says in verse 1 of chapter 1 of First John, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that life was revealed. We have seen it. We testify and declare it to you, the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. And so he, he's wanting them not to get sidetracked, not to get deterred, not to get confused by all these false teachers who have infiltrated not only the church in Ephesus, but churches in, in that part of the world. And, and so the whole Christian faith was coming under attack by these false teachers that were adding stuff, things. It was Jesus plus all this stuff. And in some instances, it wasn't even Jesus. Jesus was, was, was being denied as the Son of God. They were questioning the fact that, he, that, that of His deity of the fact that he he he's he is the God man, God stepped out of eternity into time, and became a man, but he was still divine. He is God and became a man. So there were people denying it, and there's people denying that today. There are religions that proliferate in places that are filled with superstition filled with false teachings, filled with things that have been made up that sound good to people, at least on the surface, but are not true. And it's a ploy of Satan. We know in Genesis chapter uh, 3 that the, the first people, Adam and Eve, were deceived by Satan. And that continues even to this day in, in chapter 3 it, you know, the, the serpent which is a personification of everything is evil came to Eve and because God had told them don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and uh, it, it's in the midst of the garden and, and the serpent said uh, in verse 1 of Genesis 3 did God really say you can't eat of the tree in the garden the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the tree of, uh, uh, from the trees in the garden, but about the, fruit, but about the fruit of the middle of the garden, God said, You must not eat it or touch it, and you will die. And the serpent said, You will not die. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So there was this temptation then to add. Not, well, one is to deny the teachings that that God said to deny those. Well, that's what John's getting at here. There are people, there are false teachers who were denying the teachings of Jesus. And so he uses a word here that is significant. It, it's really germane to everything he believes about Christianity, everything he believes about the faith. And it's the word remain or abide. It's the Greek word meno, M-E-N-O. And it, it means to set up residence. And, and so he really, what he's doing is reaching back, if you will, to uh, the Gospel of John. 
most commentators believe that that uh, the Gospel of John was written first, and then first, second, third John, and then the Revelation. I don't know really what order they were written in, but it appears from first, second, third John that he's reaching back then to the Gospel of John and referring then to things that he uh, has what we would would call the red letter. <laughs> Uh, the, the the teachings of Jesus, what came from the lips of Christ. And so John has said earlier in 1 John, he heard it, he saw it, he was there. So when he quotes in John's Gospel, in John chapter 14, and you know we're, we're getting into this, this great teaching, these John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 of these it's a great uh, kind of a condensation of the uh, condensing of the teachings of Jesus before he was going to the cross. And in John 14, this great passage, and he says in verse 23 of John, the Gospel of John, chapter, four, uh, chapter 14, verse 23, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode it's the same word, minnow. Make our home with Him. The one who does not love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. So, in, first, in, in the first chapter of, of John, these disciples, Andrew was one of them, the brother of, of Simon Peter. We, we really think Andrew, when God... Simon Peter and brought him, uh, as it were, to Jesus. But they were Andrew and some of the other uh, were were followers of John the Baptist, and they were curious about who about Jesus, about his teachings, and about who he who he was. And so they came to him in John chapter one. It says that two of the disciples heard him and followed Jesus. When Jesus turned, this is verse 37 of John, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. When Jesus turned to notice them following, he asked him, What are you looking for? They, he asked them a question. And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said, Come and see. It's the great question on the front end of the Gospel of John that John then seeks to answer through the gospel and and so jesus invites them on this great journey just come and see and, and so what we where is he staying he's come to stay with us he's come to live in us jesus said if you if anyone loves me he will keep my word and and we will love him and we will come and make our home our abide with him where has he come to stay he's come to stay with us so he wants to remain in us so that's what John is getting at here in encouraging these first these believers in Ephesus to remain in Christ, to stay in the Word, to let the Word live in them, that the Word is, uh, is enough. And so in the next passage in John chapter 15, it, it's, it's really clear. It, it's a visual that Jesus gives. These are. This is from the lips of Jesus, the heart of God. And he says in verse 5 of John chapter 15, I am the vine, and you are the branches. The one who remains, the same word, abide. The one who abides in me, and I in him, produces much fruit, because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not abide in me, and is, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown aside like a branch, and he withers. They gather them together, throw them in the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide or remain in you, ask whatever you want, and it will be done for you. In other words, he is the vine. If you will. this Jesus is using a 
horticultural uh, analogy that people, they may have even been walking by a vineyard and Jesus is using an illustration that they would concept so they could see it. He said, I'm the vine. So uh, 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 a grapevine comes up from the ground and the, the energy flows up from the ground, up through the vine, out into the branches. And the branches produce the fruit, but they don't produce the fruit of their own accord. They remain, they abide in the vine. The branches have no, if you cut a branch off, it dies. It has no strength. It has no energy. It has no ability to produce fruit. And so what John is saying in 1 John, he is encouraging these people to remain, to abide in Jesus. And how, so how do we do that? We allow his word to live in us. And the way we do that is we have to we have to know it. You know, we we many people today get caught up in their experience with Jesus, and that's important. You know, to share our testimony of how we came to Christ and all that. But the real way to abide in Christ is to focus on the central truths of the gospel, and that's the. Uh, supernatural birth, the, the, the incarnation it's called, God stepping out of eternity into time. It's understanding that and letting that ruminate, marinate, become part of the fabric of your life. And then understanding that Jesus, you know, the angel told Joseph, it, it's okay to marry Mary because the, the child in her is the Son of God, the Messiah. He came to save his people from their sins. And so then it, it's, it's important then to study and go deeper into what this whole salvation experience is. That without Christ, there is no such thing as Christianity. Nothing. There's nothing. There's no Christians without Christ. So focusing on Christ, focusing on his supernatural birth, his sinless life, his atoning death on the cross and his glorious resurrection and the fact that he has sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. That's how we remain in Christ. We remain in, we, we have the word in us, but we also have the Holy Spirit who interprets that word for us, who teaches us the word, who confirms to us that this word is true. So when people come along then and try to teach you something other than the gospel, when the culture tries to teach you there is no such thing as absolute truth, that you can define morality and sexuality and all that kind of stuff any way you want to, you know that they're liars, that they are the antichrist. And you know that because you know the truth. Well, we'll continue to look at this again next week. You can tell, obviously, I'm, I'm excited and energized by this. And I hope you will be as well. God bless you.